<laughs> Greetings. My name is Patricia Smith, Senior Policy Advisor for the Reinvestment Fund. TRF is a community development financial institution headquartered in Philadelphia and one of three organizations that created the Healthy Food Access Portal. I will serve as the moderator for today's Financing Basics webinar, Working with Community Development Financial Institutions, or as they most often are called, CDFIs. Joining us today are two experts in their fields. Selena Pina is Axion, Texas, Chief Program Officer. Her responsibilities including managing and supporting the business education department along with employee training and Axion's web-based proprietary loan application and credit scoring program. In previous roles at Axion, Selena has served as Vice President of Business Support, uh, Vice Pre President of Central Texas Lending, and Director of the Women's Business Center. As Chief Lending Officer Scott Sporty leads the Capital Impact Partners team that provides financing to community-based health care providers, nonprofit educational organizations, affordable housing developer, and of course, retail grocers and wholesalers. He has more than 20 years of experience in community development finance, including five years with Shore Bank in Michigan. Next. PolicyLink, the Food Trust, and the Reinvestment Fund have been working together since 2009 on a national campaign to raise awareness about the lack of access to healthy foods in low-income communities and to promote viable, just, and sustainable solutions. Our work together has resulted in funding for the federal healthy food financing initiatives at U.S. Departments of Treasury and Health and Human Services. In addition, the 2014 Farm Bill authorized a healthy food financing initiative at USDA. Next. Today's webinar is part of a series um, sponsored by the Healthy Food Access Portal. Our three organizations launched the portal in 2013. The portal houses a vast array of information for those of you working in your communities to ensure equitable access to healthy foods. We selected resources and created content that would appeal to users from diverse backgrounds. If you have not explored the portal, I encourage you to do so. And if you have visited the site already, please go back and take another look on a regular basis. New information is always being added. The Healthy Food Access Portal and this webinar are made possible by the generous support of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The PowerPoint presentations from today web today's webinar, including audio, will be posted on the portal. You can also find recordings of past webinars and notices of upcoming events. I encourage you to use the chat box to ask questions of our presenters. At the end of all presentations, I will summarize and direct questions to the appropriate speakers and speakers. Next. So today's webinar will introduce you and feature different financial products that CDFIs can use to finance your healthy um, food projects and provide examples of successful projects. I will get us started by providing an overview of community development financial institutions. Selena will follow me and provide an overview of Axion's Healthy Food Financing Initiative and SBA programs. Scott will wrap up with a discussion of new markets tax credits and how CDFIs use this important tool to help bring jobs and healthier food options to low-income communities. Next. I have had the pleasure of working for the Reinvestment Fund, a CDFI headquarter in Philadelphia since, um, um, I say, 2005, but have been involved in the organization since its founding in 1985 as the Delaware Valley Community Loan Fund. Today, TRF is one of our nation's largest CDFIs with more than um, $700 million in capital under management. 
Our mission is to create wealth and opportunity for low-income people and places through socially responsible investment. Um, since our founding, we've invested more than $1.3 billion into some of America's poorest urban and rural communities, financing everything from affordable housing to health care centers, daycare centers, and green businesses. These investments have generated more than 63,000 jobs. Next, TRF, like all CDFIs, is a mission-driven organization that provides financial products and services to people and communities underserved by traditional financial institutions and capital markets. CDFIs promote equity, community, and economic development. We provide loans and investments to nonprofits, cooperatively owned, and for-profit businesses that bring essential services to low-income communities. These investments create opportunity and build wealth for low-income communities. CDFIs often combine public resources with private capital to create innovative partnerships. So how do CDFIs differ from banks? Next. Next slide. CDFIs differ in many ways. We are often more willing to take a higher level of risk than commercial banks. For example, our underwriting criteria and collateral requirements may be more flexible. CDFIs often take a subordinate security position to other a subordinate security position to other lenders. Some are able to provide grants to help finance the project or write down interest rates or pay for market studies and business plans. CDFIs have developed areas of expertise such as financing affordable housing. Um, they have a deep understanding of public sector funding and regulatory requirements. CDFIs are in a position to provide our borrowers with technical assistance services. Um, CDFIs unlike banks, are not regulate, regulated, but some participate in an independent rating system known as CARS, which evaluates the CDFI's financial strength and performance in the area of capital, assets, management, and liquidity. Also, a CDFI must be certified by the U.S. Department of Treasury to be eligible for certain types of federal funding. Next slide. As you can see from this slide, CDFIs come in all shapes and sizes, but all have a common goal of bringing capital and credit to low-income communities. TRF, for example, is a community development loan fund. Um, we do not take individual pro um, deposits, but we do uh, attract money from individual investors. There are more than 900 CDFIs certified by the United States with service areas in all 50 states plus Puerto Rico. Some serve rural communities exclusively, uh, others focus on um, urban areas. If you're interested in locating a CDFI in your community, you can go to the CDFI Fund searchable database or the OFN, Opportunity Finance Network CDFI Locator. Links to these resources um, are, uh, will be on the closing slide. Next. What are CDFI sources of capital? Well, our money really comes from a variety of places. Um, many larger banks invest in CDFIs or partner with us to meet their Community Reinvestment Act obligations. Foundations are important sources of funds and some will lend money to CDFIs in addition to providing us with grants. These loans are called program-related investments or mission-related investments. Deposits from individuals and businesses can provide sources of capital for community development banks and credit unions that are CDFIs. Some loan funds get their capital from individuals um, like TRF who are interested in um, socially um, responsible investing or impact investing. And we're finding increasingly this is an interest that is growing across the nation. Next slide. 
I think one of the most important and significant sources of capital is the CDFI fund. The CDFI fund is a division within the U.S. Department of Treasury created in 1994 for the purpose of promoting economic revitalization and community development. The fund achieves its mission through a variety of programs which are listed on the slide. Uh, in today's webinar, we will cover two of these programs, the Healthy Food Financing Initiative and New Markets Tax Credits. Next. CDF, CDFIs are emerging as important partners in changing our food environment, financing quality food markets and other enterprises that support uh, a more just and equitable food system is uh, closely aligned with CDFIs, CDFIs' efforts to improve health, create jobs and income for low-income people, and stimulate economic growth in distressed communities. I think I'm getting it. Thank you. <laughs> um, in 2009, PolicyLinks, the Food Trust, and TRF came together and launched a national campaign to make policymakers aware that millions of Americans do not live within reasonable travel distance of a full-service supermarket. This lack of access has the troubling health and economic consequences for many communities. And bringing stores in low, to low-income communities, uh, we were, wanted to show that there were demonstrable health, economic, and social impacts. In 2011, President Obama established an interagency working group comprised of three agencies, including the CF, CDFI fund to coordinate and guide implementation of the Healthy Food Financing Initiative. Next slide. Since then, Congress has appropriated um, close to $90 million to support healthy food financing at the CDFI fund. The process is very competitive, and you must be a certified CDFI to apply. To date, 27 CDFIs have been awarded HFFI grants expanding their lending activity to grocery stores, mobile food retailers, farmers markets, food hubs, and cooperatives. Some CDFIs combine their HFFI grants with new markets tax credits to finance larger projects. Funded projects must be located in a food desert as defined by the USDA Food Atlas or other approved methods such as TRF's limited supermarket access study. The applicant must demonstrate that the project will increase access to healthy foods um, by developing retail outlets. At least 75% must be retail or support local food infrastructure. Next. In addition to federal efforts, statewide and local partnerships have also been set up to fund healthy food projects. Many of these public-private partnerships are managed by CDFIs. Um, currently, there's about 11 um, states and cities with these dedicated sources for healthy food financing pro um, projects, healthy food projects. These partnerships often include foundations and food access organizations like the Food Trust. Um, if you're interested in learning more about some of these public-private partnerships, another resource is um, the Funding Opportunity Database on the portal. I'm going to wrap up and close out with um, talking a little bit about a project that TRF helped to finance in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, next. It's called the um, Howard Park Supermarket. This is one of about 130 projects that TRF has financed since 2004. And we're very excited about this project because we believe it um, shows how not all CDFIs can come together to bring a state-of-the-art 70,000 square foot supermarket um, to a very low-income community. Um, this was a $22 million project that created more than 250 jobs um, with um, benefits. Um, the supermarket is also housing a federally qualified health care clinic 
and is working in partnership with the local school and others on a variety of, of community partnership programs. This project would not have been possible without pre-development funding, which came from HFFI and then New Marcus tax credits. And actually three CDFIs partnered in order to finance this project. And we were able to attract significant investment from J.P. Morgan Chase as the New Marcus tax credit investor and also the financer of a loan. So the closing slide I want to show is that of um, next, the supermarket on the grand opening day um, last July in which uh, people open, um, started to line up um, well in advance of the opening of the store and the excitement in the air just demonstrated how much this was um, welcome and needed in Howard Park. Uh, I'm going to now turn things over to our next speaker, Selena. Uh, Pina from Axion, Texas, and they are a CDFI that actually specializes in, a, in business lending and really target uh, entrepreneurs of color as well as small businesses in their programs, and she'll talk a little bit about their work. Thank you, Patricia. I appreciate it. So taking a, a step back when you see Axio in Texas, you probably think we only serve Texas, but we actually serve an eight-state footprint that covers um, Louisiana and the Delta states along the Mississippi River. And so I'll talk a little bit about our work, and if you can click to the next slide. We've been around uh, for 20 years, and we're primarily known as micro lenders, but within the past seven years we've incorporated multiple programs that have allowed us to serve small businesses with more capital. We currently deploy about 2.2 to 2.5 million a month of, of loans to small businesses throughout our footprint and the sizes of our loans range from anywhere from $500 to $250,000. And what's beautiful about it in terms of listening to the framework of why CDFIs were designed and, and their commitment to community development, over 60% of our, of our portfolio is dedicated to women is dedicated to minorities and 40% are um, specifically for uh, women as well. So we champion that in terms of being able to, to say that we appreciate the work of what we've been doing um, and we recently received a $1.5 million award for the HIFI loans. Um, so if you can click to the next slide, that would be great. This is a little bit about what I mentioned in terms of what we offer. I, I would say that in the past two years we have become a 7A community advantage lender and that has helped us in growing um, the size of our loans and dollar amount. And for those who um, know or do not know about the 7A community advantage, it really is a way of asking CDFIs to step up to the plate for larger loans and the SBA provides a guarantee of anywhere from 75 to 85 percent on that loan. Obviously there's a process that goes with that and we have been pretty successful in terms of being able to, to deploy um, that program as well. The next slide please. So I think you know Patricia mentioned you know, how we're different and who we serve, and this is really to give you a snapshot of who Acción um, provides capital to. When we think about lending outside the box, uh, Acción, here at Acción, we look at those folks who potentially um, are bankable or who are really in a position of potentially not having healthy alternative financing um, and, and really using title loans and predatory lending. And if you put that in context, in the, most of the states that we serve, 
um, predatory lending is unregulated and can go up to 600% in interest rate. And when we first started in 1994, we, our largest loan size was $10,000. And as you can see, we've grown. And I'll talk more about the 504. But this gives you an idea of where our appetite lies and, and really where our niche um, falls as well. We, we have proven that startup capital is a critical component of success, and, and we actively um, provide that capital within our portfolio. We look at non-targeted industries or industries that are potentially deemed high-risk models and work with our clients to ensure that um, there's opportunity for them to grow. And, and really thinking about the five C's of, of credit in, in terms of potentially they don't have the most stellar um, credit score or the ability to prove capacity because they um, have limited um, access to resources and potentially a lack of collateral. The next slide, please. So, you know, CDFIs are not banks, uh, or some of them are actually, but we are not. We are not a, a depository agency as well, as mentioned earlier. And one of the things that another issue or really the market driver of online lending is pretty significant to us. And so our time frame of providing capital ranges anywhere from 15 to 35 days max. And as you can see here, this is really the step in which we take, the steps we take to supporting our clients walking through our process. And we use this also to educate our referral partners, both nonprofits and banks, so that there is a clear expectation of this is what we do as a business and how we actually um, look at our applications and process them. Next slide, please. So I think Patricia hit a lot of these um, components. For us, we believe that our most solid um, community partner in terms of relationships and, and providing capital are through banks. And we've seen that in our data. We track, as most TDFIs, a lot of data points. And we believe that if there is a way of connecting financial resources in the community from a traditional bank to a CDFI, it is a win-win situation for a customer, for the CDFI, and for the bank as well. And I say that because in terms of opportunities, some CDFIs also are dedicated to learning um, and have a smaller loan portfolio. And so either way, there's a component of education that potentially happens within that referral and relationship building. We can't stress enough the importance of, of working with others in each of the communities we serve. Um, because we are a nonprofit, we have limited resources specifically to um, marketing and outreach. So next slide. So when we received this 1.5 million, we asked ourselves, what should we be doing with this? And when we put our proposal together, we recognized we were already doing some of this work in providing um, small business loans in food deserts and in high poverty areas within Texas and in the counties that we served. Our funds for um, the healthy food initiatives and really is only based in Texas, but we applied our eligibility for our eight state footprint. So the grant that we received from Treasury is really only for Texas, but we do promote this throughout our footprint and honor the terms and agreements that we actually have for the CDFI fund as well. We did this because as, as many of you know, if you look at um, a, a map of some of the most poorest counties and, and parishes in the nation, and the Delta is probably one compared to South Texas, which is in our footprint, the border. And we wanted to be able to ask and, and share 
really universal approach to fresh loans. And so we designed what we call the fresh loan. And this is really the elements of what um, the eligibility can be used for in terms of accessing our capital for the Healthy Food Initiative. Next slide, please. So again, just to, to go over, we actually reduced our interest rates on this in terms of um, we believe that it's important to have innovation in, in areas. And because we have some high urban but also some high rural, we recognize the importance. And we also fund startups. It was important for us to combine um, really our commitment to uh, increase volume of these types of loans, but then also to support the entrepreneur, especially if they were um, considering expanding their business model for including fresh food. So this is a, an example of um, Bob Mishler is one of our um, borrowers. He actually has a farm, but he also has a food truck, and we um, worked with him in terms of helping him be able to go serve certain areas in San Antonio with his farm with fresh product um, every week. And it's been pretty successful in him seeing um, first coming in as a just a truck and not knowing anyone to when he's not there, people are wondering where is Bob. Um, so this is an example of something that is, you know, under a micro lending portfolio and then also being able um, to support really the innovation of taking your product to a community. The next slide, please. The next one um, that I was asked to visit about was really our SBA 504. So in 2008, uh, we really saw we really asked ourselves, what more can we do to serve um, entrepreneurs, but also CDFIs have this drive for having some element of self-sufficiency where we're actually rated on that in terms of how do we create and generate revenue off of our portfolio and rely potentially less on restricted funds. And Janie Barrera, who is our CEO, has uh, taken the approach of diversification as a critical component of success, just like many businesses, and applied it to Oxion, Texas. And so the SBA 504 is a really a partnership loan, if you will, with a bank and with a borrower to be able to access a larger amount of debt in terms of being able to purchase heavy equipment or purchase property or special purpose building um, and also for startups. And so the model of an SBA 504, if you think of um, a pie, right, the, a pie chart, you're looking at the project financing where the bank is a partner and provides 50% of that capital. Um, Axion Texas, as, as the CDC or the 504 lender, provides anywhere from 40 to 35 percent of um, the debt um, through bonds with SBA. And the customer sits at anywhere from 10 to 15 percent, uh, 20 percent, I apologize, in terms of their equity into a deal. And so we've actually funded uh, several different um, small businesses, both in urban and, and rural settings, to provide either innovative food and drink product or um, being able to add to their business model in terms of um, having a retail presence for healthy foods. And the example that I have here is a small distillery that started here in San Antonio called Dorkle. And we partnered with um, a bank in order to provide um, these two fellows here the ability to create a brandy um, in an urban setting in San Antonio. And it has done very well in terms of being able to um, grow their market, also share the story of alternative healthy financing. Um, and it's a, it's a very exciting project that we feel very strongly has a potential, 
really positive effect of how, again, we think about we do lending, but how can we do more to help support innovation and healthy um, access with small business in mind. And so, you know, really the 504 project, if you think about it, is, is underwritten by a bank. It, the Acción or the CDC has many relationships, regardless of what CDC is, in terms of helping a client find one to then potentially have a relationship for a lending partner, partner in doing the SBA 504. So some of the things in considering really the projects are that usually they have to be more than $50,000 and they can go up to $5 million on the debenture side. And that is the CDC side. So the sky's the limit with an SBA 504, if you will. And in, in terms of where we see our sweet spot as we look at where our debentures sit, and they're usually um, at 250 to 500,000 where we come in. So uh, we're a smaller SBA 504, but we do a lot of work. Uh, next slide, please. So I listed some resources that I think are important for all of us to be able to look at. Really the desert map is probably one of the most important components of you know, do people qualify. But it's also good to know in terms of just understanding your markets, understanding your communities, and really being able to see where there are pockets of opportunity, um, and it may be already be happening, which is the beautiful thing in terms of business owners moving in there. And if not, what is the potential either Main Street um, project opportunity or urban renewal opportunity? And I think Healthy Foods, through traditional lending and through alternative lending, such as I mentioned for businesses, along with um, the 504 and as our next speaker will talk about new market tax credits will serve a really great um, jumping board for success in economic development. Thank you. I'm uh, Chief Lending Officer at Capital Impact Partners, and um, as Celine said, thank you very much. We're going to talk a little bit about the New Markets Tax Credit, specifically how it can be accessed uh, for grocery program transactions and some of the benefits in low-income communities. So um, if we can move to the next slide after this one, Capital Impact Partners is a 30-year-old CFI uh, serving the country from offices in the Washington, D.C. area, Detroit, and Oakland, California. Um, we have been lending to the healthy food and grocery industry since our inception in 1984, um, and during that time have provided about $110 million in grocery transactions, about 50 of that in, in the last uh, two or three years alone. And we received, actually, I just noticed, I made a mistake, that we've actually received $492 million in new markets allocation, and about $25 million of that has gone to uh, grocery-specific transactions in both California and Michigan. Next slide. So uh, Capital Impact Partners is managing or actually managing one healthy food program and in, in the process of developing another one. Um, we have, uh, since late 2010, uh, been the CDFI intermediary and program manager for the California Freshworks Fund, which is a California statewide initiative to improve access to healthy food, primarily through retail. And then uh, in the state of Michigan, the Michigan Good Food Fund, which uh, is focused on retail, but also on uh, a wider spectrum of access to healthy foods, including production and distribution. So through those two programs, uh, we are providing a full range of financing from pre-development, um, real estate development, from equipment inventory, working capital financing, um, working with basically all types of retail and uh, production organization structures, cooperatives, for-profits, non-profit organizations, 
um, all with the theme that these are borrowers or organizations that help provide or increase access to healthy food uh, in low-income, moderate-income communities, um, food deserts, and low-access areas in the states of primarily California and Michigan. <coughs> Although we do lending nationwide, our focus on healthy foods has been in uh, across the state of Michigan and across the state of California. Next slide. So um, for those of you who have some familiarity with the New Market Tax Credit Program, it's fairly complicated because um, there are some limitations and expectations about eligibility both for the borrowers and for the, for the style of transaction. So um, borrower eligibility is particularly important, um, partly focused on geography, partly focused on how the businesses work. But for the work that CDFIs do, and especially for the types of financing we're trying to provide uh, to improve access to healthy food in underserved areas, new markets can be helpful for transactions that are sized $5 million or greater. The complexity of the new markets program um, sort of adds some cost in legal and accounting that often make it fairly difficult to do a smaller new markets transaction on a standalone basis. So talking about borrower eligibility, if you think about our borrower itself, uh, it needs to be active and working in a low-income community. It needs to conduct its business activity in a low-income community. Um, and it needs to show that it does, oh, I'm sorry, yes, I will. Um, I will talk a little bit louder. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, and uh, there are generally for the facilities that we're financing, they are located in census tracts that qualify. Um, it would be difficult for a, there are ways that one can work on a targeted population basis that would be difficult for a grocery business to be able to do that. Next slide. Um, so the important thing to know here is that to qualify just basically <clears throat> this, the grocery store, the project, needs to be located in a census tract that has a poverty rate of at least 20% or its um, median income is no greater than 80% of the area or statewide median. So that's just the basic qualification for new markets. Um, many recipients of new markets tax credit allocation want to focus on those areas that have an even higher distress. And uh, so in order to qualify for additional tax credits, since it shows they're meeting a um, higher, sort of a higher standard, um, those are those areas, those census tracts that have a poverty rate of at least 30%. Um, median income is up to 60% or, or less. Um, the unemployment rate in that census tract is at least one and a half times the national average or uh, sort of picking from a list of enterprise zone, tribal areas, um, other affected areas that, uh, that have been deemed to be deserving of additional um, economic activity and development work. So you need to have a business that works in a low income area and you need to be able to qualify it within the census tract that meets the criteria for the new markets program. Next slide. <clears throat> As we think about the program itself, and moving on to this next slide, I'll, um, there are many benefits. And as I as I mentioned, the, first the challenge is wanting to the benefits really accrue to those borrowers or for those projects that are larger than five million dollars or so in size. But if they qualify, <clears throat> the interest rate can be favorable because there is a federal tax credit subsidy that's brought into the transaction that helps bring down the total cost of the financing. Um, there is a potential for a higher loan to value. Um, it's not uncommon to see loan to value of 90% or greater, which well exceeds what's typically available through traditional financial institutions. Um, these transactions are typically structured as um, interest-only transactions, which minimize the amount of uh, debt service expense during the seven-year term of the tax credit transaction. And the blended interest rate that brings in the tax credit subsidy typically brings the cost to something well below a market rate of interest. And then one of the interesting features of the tax credit program is that most are done with what's called a, a leveraged structure that combines debt and the equity from the new market's tax credit subsidy itself. And, and typically, um, the tax credit subsidy is, is put 
as a, a portion of the loan that does not need to be repaid by the borrower. Um, and that generally means that somewhere between 20 and on the high side, 30% of the transactions can be left as equity in the borrower, meaning that really a small amount of that loan or only you know, 60, 70, sorry, 70 to 80% of that loan needs to be repaid. Um, which is a huge benefit to a borrower, especially one trying to start a business in an area that hasn't um, been ripe for development over the past few years. Next slide. Um, as I've mentioned a few times, transaction size is an important consider consideration here. <clears throat> and then there's also a, a tax consequence for a for-profit borrower that's receiving essentially the debt forgiveness. And uh, there are ways to structure some element of it. And another sort of a converse to that is that you have a for-profit borrower that's receiving a pretty substantial uh, subsidy. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of new market allocates and or lenders want to make sure that there's a community benefit agreement so that for-profit organization um, will show that it is going to continue to serve low-income or underserved populations in return for the benefits receiving for, of the New Markets Tax Credit. Um, some quirks about the New Markets Tax Credit structure just mean that the loans can't be repaid. Uh, typically, there are limitations to allowing low or no prepayment of the debt during the seven-year term of the loan. And um, then there's a, a balloon repayment that needs to occur at the, at, at the end of the seven-year tax credit compliance period. So that's something the borrower needs to be prepared to um, save up for and, and refinance at the end of year seven. <clears throat> and then there's the challenge that um, there's a fairly small supply of new market tax credit allocation. And if you've been looking for it, you know it's difficult to find and it's very competitive uh, to actually receive the allocation in the first place. Um, so if you do have a project in mind or have someone who is looking for new markets, just know that um, sometimes it can take uh, quite some time because most people who have tax credit allocation now um, have probably committed it um, and need to wait for the next round of allocation in order to start with new projects. Next slide. So uh, moving to this next slide, which is just show a graphic illustration of what the transaction sort of looks like. Um, this is a, a very rough example, and it can be much more complicated, but it shows on the left side um, about $6.7 million in debt going into the transaction, and about $3.3 .3 million that represents the um, tax credit equity, which the tax credit equity investor has bought at a discount. <clears throat> so they're paying somewhere between 80 and 85 or so cents on the dollar. Uh, for the tax credit investment they're returning or receiving. And the benefit is that they don't need to receive the cash back from their investment because they purchased it at a discount, which is what allows the borrower to receive that loan B down at the bottom um, as, uh, as a benefit at the end of the transaction. So as you can see here, after some fees and costs have been taken out, um, the borrower is borrowing about $9.8 million on a project and only needs to repay uh, the balance of loan A, which is about $6.6 .6 million. So it's a pretty significant benefit that they will receive um, for developing a grocery store or other projects. And uh, in our experience, we in the last two or three years have financed uh, four different grocery stores in California and Michigan, um, all using a very similar structure to this, all in areas that had been underserved by grocery stores that had been considered food desert according to the USDA. Um, and they were using the proceeds of the new markets allocation to either expand existing operations to add more space for healthy food, primarily to expand their uh, produce departments, or in one case actually be a whole new development on a lot that had not seen any development in about 30 years. So in all these cases, these were grocery stores that, um, that really were meeting the needs of their neighborhoods and that had expanded their services in order to provide more healthy food access in those particular areas. Next slide. Um, these are some of the resources that are available as you think about how to <clears throat> track first eligibility. That top one um, is an easy map that shows what census tracts qualify for the new markets program. 
And then the second two um, are a listing of those new market tax credit LXTs that still have tax credit availability today. Um, and then the list at the bottom shows the list of everyone who received an award uh, during the program's history. So you can look them up and, and uh, connect with those organizations that work in your state or particular region. Next slide. This is a, just a graphic representation. Uh, this happens to be a portion of Los Angeles. Um, <clears throat> just to show how the map looks, the red areas are those areas that meet the severely or the highly distressed qual qualification for tax credit alloc allocation. Um, and then the, the yellower areas um, meet secondary qualifications, and the gray areas don't, don't qualify at all. Um, so it's pretty easy to either look at this graphically across the whole mapped area or to put in a specific address and see what areas qualify uh, using census data from the most recent census. Next slide. Um, that's information about me. Um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, we're going to take a few minutes now to um, go through the list of questions that we've received. Um, please feel free to use your chat box to um, post the question. I'm actually going to get the um, ball rolling here with a, a great question that came in. And that is, um, does your pro do you have to work in the, in, in the area that the CDFI works in? Um, and I think that is getting at the question that um, if you don't have a CDFI in your community, what can you do? Um, so first, I'm just going to get the ball rolling by saying there are lots of national um, CDFIs who work nationally. Now, often when it comes to their healthy food financing um, grant, they still prioritize because you know these are still limited resources of funds. But um, there's a CDFI called the Local Initiative Support Corporation. It's headquartered in New York, but it's done a lot of work in Michigan. Um, you heard Scott, they're a national CDFI. They're working in California and also in Michigan. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And I also want to take this as an opportunity to mention that in recognition of this issue, policy link to food trust and TRF, successfully got included in the Farm Bill, another healthy food financing initiative. And that one is designed specifically to support a national fund manager so that it can go into areas where there may not be a CDFI working um, on, on this issue or partnering with CDFIs um, so that they can go into areas. And TRF and, and others have been working to build the capacity of, of, of smaller CDFIs to do this work. Um, the next question I'm actually going to um, probably pose to both Selena and to um, Scott because I think it's one that gets to the issue of how do you decide what project to fund? Um, what factors do you take into consideration? You know, how do you ex assess the risk of that project? And do you always need collateral? Some, and if so, what type of collateral in order to borrow from a CDFI? And Selena, maybe you would like to go first and then Scott? Sure, I'd be happy to. So we, we have plenty of triggers that allow us to determine viability of a project. The first is we have our, our, our own underwriting and risk model assessment that we apply to every application that comes in. That risk model is designed over the 20 years of our portfolio performance um, of applicants and borrowers. And so that really lays a foundation for then what type of special programming could you potentially overlay and for us, in terms of what is, you know, what what makes a project viable in the context of the healthy food, obviously there's parameters that we have to address in terms of geography um, and and population served. So that's one of our 
you know, outside of the black and white of looking at capacity and credit scores and collateral. And we, we tout that we actually will help individuals, um, entrepreneurs who even have a, a negative uh, uh, or a zero score on their um, credit history in order for them to become, again, part of financial mainstream. So in terms of the set criteria, it varies on the, the individual coming in, but we do have standards in the foundation. On collateral, we have products that allow us not to use collateral at 100%, but over a majority of our products are aligned with some form of collateral um, that is non-homestead related. And that could be, when we think of collateral, you know, we, we're thinking real estate, but we'll, we'll look at um, equipment, we'll look at vehicles that are older than 10 years, um, we'll also look at equipment that's over 10 years, and then also the purchase potentially becomes collateral as well. So just because someone doesn't have it, if they're purchasing equipment, there's a potential opportunity to leverage that purchase within the context of the loan. Um, so I think those are really some of the elements that we think about. And I guess the last one would be, you know, there's, you know, this sort of commitment of in, in both rural and, and I say both rural and urban settings because we live in, we serve both of those settings, is a, a main street driver or an urban renewal component really excites us about opportunity to jumpstart or really, as I mentioned earlier, be a, a diving board for something that will help people um, transform a community. Mm -hmm. And Scott, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, well, I'd say I really sort of building on what Selena said there at the end, that we're looking through two lenses. We want, uh, uh, we're looking at a lens of, of social impact and the, and the types of benefit that project will bring to the community. Um, as well as credit worthiness and uh, collateral is certainly a secondary uh, question after we make sure that those first two are met well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, there was another question that came in for me and it sort of piggybacks off of that issue of so social impact. Um, I talked about a project in Baltimore um, and one question was, well, how do you get started on a project like that? Uh, I always say that you really, these projects have to be rooted in community desire and, and advocacy. So in Baltimore, um, there was an organization um, called BUILD um, that was a community organizing group. And they had been advocating for more than a decade for a new supermarket to come to this particular neighborhood. And they basically rallied the troops and, to, and, and uh, put pressure on the city government to acquire the land. It was a supermarket that had closed down. So the city government acquired that land and that kind of became the rallying point. And then because the community was so actively engaged in the project, you know, they were instrumental in interviewing potential operators and also talking to them about how, you know, job um, programs and other benefits that the community would could, could access. And while I don't know if there was a written agreement, um, they're clearly, um, you know, when they endorse the particular operator based on their track record and their commitments, um, it was taken quite seriously. So again, I think the community voice in any um, community development project or Healthy Food Access project is essential. Um, I'm going to turn back to uh, another question, and I know we tend, we lenders tend to use a lot of technical terms um, like loan of value and due diligence, um, collateral, and if you are an individual who just wants to get started or just wants to you know, say, I have an idea, I have a concept, or an organization or a nonprofit, uh, what would you suggest to be the first step uh, when you're seeking financing? You've gotten community support, um, they love the project, you've gotten the public sector, um, maybe local government support, 
and now you want to start thinking about financing for the project. What do you suggest as the first step? And either one of you can take it. Selena, maybe you want to kick it off again and, and sure. Scott follow. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in terms, Scott may be a little bit more um, understanding of a more mature project um, for some of those elements. But regardless of your of where, when we look at a 504 project, you know, we're going to pull um, obviously uh, the last two years of your tax return. So it's important to have those ready and perfected or completed or um, filled out in terms of an extension as accurately as possible. That's probably one of our important elements that I think is for the 504. For our micro lending and for our small business lending, folks really have a vision on their own and as I mentioned earlier, referral sources such as nonprofits, even community activists as you mentioned earlier, and bankers will refer folks to Accion and I always, when I used to lend, my first comment was uh, just, well, welcome first of all, and second is be, be ready to become financially naked. Um, mm -hmm. So really understanding your financials, um, whether you like them or not, but just knowing what you have puts you in a better position, right? It allows you to drive, it allows you to pause, and so that reflection for the small business lending is just really important to us because it is a journey and usually a long journey with Axion. Um, the first time lend and we do step lending as well. And you know for the 504 initial assessment, it really is about you know the tax returns and financial statements and really understanding the cost of your project for both the small business and the 504 is important too. Mm -hmm. Scott, anything you would like to um, add? I would. I think I'd add two thoughts. The, the first is um, I wouldn't go through the, I guess, the challenge of, of filling out an application. Start with the conversation. Um, describe what it is that you want to do because I think so we, I know, and other lenders will have some ideas for how to approach it that may suggest it's not time to apply yet or this might be the way you want to try this. Mm -hmm. um, we also have some small grant programs that can help with capacity building, business planning, so that might be also another way to get the project sort of off the ground, uh, prove that it can work and become credit worthy over time. just depends on where you are in your life cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then there was one other question um, that I um, came in, and it's about whether or not CDFIs prefer um, a particular legal entity and it really depends on the CDFIs. There is one CDFI that works nationally called the Nonprofit Finance Fund mm -hmm. and they strictly find nonprofit organizations. They don't, um, to my knowledge, you know, fund. That's their priority. Um, the second is um, most CDFIs like TRF, we actually do arrange um, everybody except for individual. So, for example, we will finance a nonprofit organization, a for-profit business, as long as that for-profit business is, um, you know, meets our mission and social um, objectives. And we've also um, have um, succeeded in financing a number of food um, cooperatives. In fact, they believe there are about two or three CDFIs in the nation that the only thing they do is finance food co-ops, or not food, but business, cooperatively owned businesses, a lot of which are food. And that's so, so really the legal entity um, isn't as important, but there are you know, different um, programmatic objectives of CDFL I can add. Um, I noticed that we're getting close to the 3 o'clock hour and need to wrap up. I just wanted to say some final things if we go to the next slide. Um, first and foremost, everyone will get a copy of this um, PowerPoint and it will be posted on the Healthy Food Access Portal, um, so you'll get that in hand. Here again are some resources that we mentioned throughout 
the presentation. Some of those were also posted um, to the chat box. Uh, if you have any question about locating a resource, I would strongly urge you to go to the Healthy Food Access Portal. Next slide. Oops. Next, yeah. So here's the, the web address for the portal. Or if you just have a question or um, want to go into more details, you know, shoot us a question via info at Healthy Food, Healthy Food Access Portal. Um, please follow us on tr tr Twitter at um, Access Food. And last but not least, October the 24th is Food Day, and TRF, Policy Link, and the Food Trust are going to be actively chatting up healthy food access and social justice and economic justice as part of the Food Day Twitter. And you can find more information on that by Googling Food Day. I neglected to put the, um, the handle and, and, and the hashtag on this slide. So um, it's talking to everyone. And I hope um, we can see you in the near future at another webinar. Thank you.